All right, I'll let everybody get settled and we're going to jump in again, as you guessed it, First Peter. So, uh, like I said, I, I thought maybe we were going to get through um, First Peter 6 through 9 and I started working this out and I got to verse 6 and then I got to verse 7 and I'm like, I'm already on seven pages of notes to be teaching and preaching off of. I'm like, yeah, no, there ain't, there's no way. There's no way. So we're only getting through two more verses today, but that's awesome because that's how powerful the word of the Lord is. So let me pray and then we'll get after it. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be here, gathered with those who are here with us physically, God, those who, who may hear this um, through other means, Lord, and I pray the power of your spirit would move through any means, God, to deliver your word. And I know that we don't come with wise and persuasive speech, God, that words are worthless apart from the power of your spirit. So God, we just pray that you would um, fill this place, God, and, and, and anoint my lips and my mouth, touch them with the hot coal from, coal from your altar, Lord. I know that I'm a man of unclean lips, and and I, I just bring myself and, and my words and my thoughts under your blood, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that your power would move in these words and that they would cut us to the heart and undo us and that we would be filled with um, and a joy that can't hardly be controlled or expressed, God, as we move forward. So just praise you for the ability to gather together and to preach and proclaim your word. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Cut it out, Esther. We just got started. We'll see. Okay, so 1 Peter. All right, so our te- I'm going to read our text, and then we're going to be reminded and refresh of the context of our text. All right, so 1 Peter, we're going to be in 1 Peter 6 and 7 all day today. So it says... In this, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may, have, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined in the fire, may result in something. That it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Okay, this is obviously a lot in this section of scriptures right off the bat. And all this we greatly rejoice. What are we greatly rejoicing in? Who remembers what we've been talking about the last two weeks? Anything. Any concept of what we were talking about. What is he saying? And all these stuff we greatly rejoice. What is it? Our inheritance. Remember? You've been bought again into a living hope by something imperishable by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been bought in and you've been bought to something, to an inheritance. What? That is is uh, spotless, unspoiled, and unfading. And what about this awesome inheritance? What about this living home? What about this awesome inheritance? What about the fact that this hope is alive and well? Right? Yeah, it's being kept for you in heaven. And what's he say? Oh, I'm going to get you to it. I'm going to guard you to it by my power. It says, and you are being guarded by God's power to it. So it says, so this is the context for what Peter says right here, very next thing in verse 6. In this all, you greatly rejoice. Oh my goodness, does that not call for rejoicing? In this all, you greatly rejoice. Okay? And so we have to have the context for what he says next. Though for a little while, for how long? A little. A little while. You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Just one trial? No, a multitude, right? A bombardment trials and all kinds of trials. These have come to prove something to you. And that's what we're going to work out today. So the joy of a Christian, listen, he goes, in all this you greatly rejoice. The joy of a Christian can only arise from a heavenly perspective. First and foremost, you'll see that over and over and over again throughout the scriptures. How is it that we rejoice in our suffering? How is it that we give thanks in all circumstances? How is it that Paul learned to be content in all things? How is it that under the threat of persecution, calling out from under the stones that were upon him, that he could say, praise be to God? How is it that Peter, knowing that he was in prison, about ready to be crucified, felt so unworthy to be crucified as his Lord and Savior did that he chose to be, as historians say, crucified upside down, that he could say, praise be to God. This is to my, con- the, this is to my commendation. This is so many. How is it possible that in all these things we can greatly rejoice? What can only be born out from a heavenly perspective, an eternal perspective, from a certainty of our relationship to God in, in heaven through the completed work of Christ. That's why it says, 
In all this we can greatly rejoice, though for a little while. Because listen, the reason why you can rejoice is because your inheritance. The reason why you can rejoice is because the joy set before you. The reason why you can rejoice is because it's in heaven. Your reward, your inheritance, your heir, your sonship, your allotment is in heaven. It's the presence of God. So in all these things you can greatly rejoice. Because joy and rejoicing is not based on circumstances. All right, It's rooted in truth. That's the key distinction to make about joy versus happiness. Happiness is all circumstantial. It's fleeting. It's like a vapor of the wind. It's here, to mar here today, gone tomorrow. Happiness is one of the most vain attributes that you can build your life around is happiness. It will fail you every single time. It will promise you everything and it will deliver to you nothing. And sadly, happiness has replaced joy in this modern church dispensation. They have made happiness one of the key attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't exist. It's nowhere in Scripture. The word happiness is not in script, not in the New Testament that I've seen. It is definitely not a fruit of the Spirit and it is definitely not a, a root of the foundation of God. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of His throne, not friendliness and happiness. And so when we, try, when we seek to build our life up off of the attributes of happiness, which is temporal, which is circumstantial, which is based on relationships being positive or negative. It's based on finances being positive or negative. It's based on the world around you being positive or negative. It's going from highlights real to highlights real to highlights real to life. It will overcome you and it will disappoint you 10 times out of 10. So that's, what not, that's not what Paul or Peter is saying here. I keep saying Paul, Peter. That's not what Peter, it's because I'm looking at Paul. You're messing me up, bro. Um, that's not what it's saying here. It's saying, in all this we greatly rejoice. What is, what, how is it that the joy of a believer can be so rooted, so firm and established, so persevering and enduring, that as you're being mocked, scoffed, reviled, you're being called Beelzebub because they called Jesus Beelzebub, what, how much more are they going to call you? You're being falsely accused. You're being falsely imprisoned. You're, you're having all kinds of insults hurled at you. Injustice upon injustice is being heaped upon you. The whole world is calling evil good and good evil. The church is calling evil good and good evil. They're voting for Biden, right? And, and, and how is it that in the midst of all these things that you can say, praise be to the Lord and of, of the Lord God Almighty and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Through him we have been born again into a living hope. Through him we have this inheritance. Through him we have all these things. Because it is not based on anything that has to do with this life. It's based on everything that has to do with the joy that is set before us. It says, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. Was, there, was it for happiness set before him that Christ endured the cross? You guys remember what was going on in Gethsemane? What Jesus was doing? It says he was overcome with anxieties and consternations and afflictions to the point of death. He was so filled with the fear of... The physiological fear and the anxieties about what he was about ready to have to endure, he was so overcome to the point of death, to the point where he vasodilated and he's actually sweating blood, to he cries out, this is, this, Christ, everything was created for him, through him, and back unto him, and here he is crying out, oh God, I can't, Lord God, make this cup pass from me. If it's at all possible, take this cup from me. But not my will be done, Lord, your will, I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. It was not for the happiness set before him that Christ endured the cross, it was for the joy set before him that Christ endured the cross. Because the joy had to do with the fact that it was rooted in truth, in an identity, in an eternal placement, in an eternal security for those whom he loved. And that's what equipped him to be able to, to endure. And that's what Peter establishes right here off the bat. Boom! And all this is great, re greatly rejoiced. Church? He's like, church, hey, hello. Remember this thing? Living hope? Remember the inheritance? Remember God's going to guard you to it? Remember it's being kept secure? You're going to be good to go? Hey, in all these things, you greatly rejoice. And he goes, so, though for now, for a little while, you may have to suffer all kinds of trials. He like, he instantly diminishes the tumult of this life. Because he goes, because this has a greater value. This has the greater weight. Let's throw it on a scale. Boom. The joy and the glory and the hope slams to the ground. All these other things, however difficult they may be, he goes, I'm actually going to always diminish him compared to what I know is coming before you, right? So this is a big deal. Joy is an inward assurance. It is an inward assurance. Think about that. 
joy is. Happy happiness is not an inward assurance. Happiness is an outward vapor. Joy is an inward assurance, right? And joy is and will be and must be coexistent in the Christian life. Coexistent with manifold, diverse, many, multiple trials that assail us. You know, depending on your translation, I'll say the manifold trials, the diverse trials, the many trials, the multiple trials, right? It is, joy is actually consistent and coexistent with the Christian calling and election. We are to be, we actually as believers in Christ are to be the most acquainted with sorrows. I mean, have you ever thought about that? A godly man or woman should be more acquainted with sorrows than anybody else. Have you been told that in church? I mean, generally we've been told to shrink back from feel, feeling and experiencing sorrow, our heaviness, our lament, our woe. We're told the opposite, that friendliness should be the chief pursuit of your reality. Who is Jesus Christ? How is he, how is he regarded? What was the title that he was given? Man of Sorrows. Jesus knew sorrow more than anything else. And as we increasingly become united with Him, as we're increasingly becoming sanctified, as we're increasingly being made aware of, of these ideas of eternity and of the kingdom of God and of separation from God and of, of being an heir of a promise or being a son of a disobedient or being, being adopted or being illegitimate and, and being of the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. And as we become increasingly aware of these things, we too as believers actually become increasingly more and more sorrowful, not more and more happy filled but at the same time we become more and more joy filled it's the strangest relationship ever because we go praise be to God praise be to God this isn't it praise be to God that that he's a God of reconciliation and of redemption and of re of restoration praise be to God that this doesn't have the final say this earth this world these powers of darkness these Luciferian elite these governments these failed relationships this People imposing their sinful will against us, they don't have the final say, right? We ought to be the most acquainted with sorrow, with heaviness and vexation and consternation and indignation, even at these things. Because we, we have compassion when we see the curse of sin having its way in people's lives. We're like, oh God, we have compassion. Like Jesus said, he looked on the people and was filled with compassion. He saw they were helpless and harassed, sheep without a shepherd. I think about that all the time. I think about that in relationships that we have in here, that we know intimately. I'm like, oh God, and I'm sorrowful because I hate to see the deception. I hate to see what the enemy is rot rotting on his people. I hate it. And so I'm filled with sorrow. Why? Because I'm filled with compassion, right? We have to be filled with sorrow when we see the dishonor in the front done to God. I am sorrowful at things that I'm hearing coming from Christian leadership in our nation, the articles that I read. The things that they're saying. The things that they're attaching the name of Jesus Christ to is horrifying. And I am sorrowful, right? We ought to be sorrowful at the condition and the assault against and from within the church. The things that are coming against the church and the things that are within the church, right? It creates this degree of sorrow within us. And the condition of mankind, period. You look at the state of man, you're like, oh God, oh God, have mercy. So that's why the rejoicing in something that is secure, something that is an eternal, something that we're going to be guarded to by God's power, something that the completed work of Christ has already assured us is such a big deal because all these things are true. All these things are absolutely true. Um, you know, we, we are told that we, you will be arrested. Right? We said, they said, rejoice in all these things. Hey, diverse trials, manifold trials, you will be arrested. Hey, by the way, you will be persecuted. Do you want to be godly? You will be persecuted. In fact, there is a very distinct inverse relationship to the more we allow the Lord to refine us and purge us and crush the sin out of us and we put to death our carnal man and we seek to live for the things of the Lord. If anyone wants to live a life in godliness, he will be persecuted. It doesn't say if anybody wants to live, live a life uh, it, as a convert, you will be persecuted. There's a lot of people that are converts. There's a lot of people that have salvation by the completed work of Christ, but maybe just because of the wrestling of the flesh and the spirit, they don't allow the Holy Spirit to achieve certain things, and they're probably not going to be persecuted that much. They Why would they? They look similar to the world. They act similar to the world. They use the same language of the world. They have some, Why would the enemy come against them? They're not a threat. They're not. A, they're not a threat to to their efforts and their to to their endeavor. 
But as we seek to increasingly live a life in godliness through the word and by the power of the Holy Spirit working things out in us, we actually become an enemy to them and we absolutely, hands down, will be persecuted. So how much more is there reason for us to rejoice that these trials are but for a little while? And, and I don't know, we talked about this on Thursday night. How much more so important to rejoice that what the Lord has given us is only a cup to drink from? A cup which has a bottom. A cup which will eventually be exhausted. He's given us a cup to drink from. Just like Christ Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, He said, Lord, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but you, your will be done. Praise be to God that it's light and momentary affliction. That's a little while that we've only been given just this cup to drink from, and there is a bottom to their cup. It is going to run dry, because one day that cup is going to replace with something that will never, never be exhausted. And that is the streams of living water. And like David said, we will proclaim and rejoice that my cup overflows. It will never, the cup of joy, the cup of the presence of the Lord, the cup of the goodness of the Lord. When we take that cup in his presence, it will never cease to be empty. It will never run dry. And we will have the stream of living waters right there before us, running out from the throne of God from which we can drink day after day after day from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. How much more ought we to rejoice? For a little while. For a little while we have to do these things. 1 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 assures us of this. This was actually when I was a super young guy. Well, how old were we when we got married? I don't know, 24, 25? It's the first sermon I ever preached was on this. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Little did I know that it was going to have to be a life verse that I have to constantly command my faculties to believe and trust. I have to command... O soul, be still and know that the Lord is good. O soul, you better be still and know that your moment, your afflictions are light and momentary. O soul, you better realize that the Lord is achieving something in you. So the Lord has, little did I know that this is what he's going to call me to, to have to wrestle out the majority of my life. So 1 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't what? Lose heart. Huh, that's a pretty powerful word. How many of you lose heart? How regularly do you lose heart? Woe is me, God. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Where are you, Lord? How long must I cry out and you don't answer? How long, Lord, are your ears silent to me? How long, God? Oh, we lose heart. I'm vexed by the wicked. Why do they always succeed, right? We lose heart. But he says, therefore, we don't lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions. What kind of afflictions? Light, light and momentary. Wait, what kind are they? Light. Light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far away is them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. There it is again. Light and momentary. A little while. Why? Because of something eternal. Why? Because of something eternal. Why? Because of something eternal. And every single epistle, and every single letter, and every single encouragement to the church, and every single encouragement to Israel all throughout the Old Testament is constantly speaking to this whole concept. Listen, church, body, my people, Israel, the church, Gentiles, Jews, the olive, the wild olive branch, grafted in. Keep your mind steadfast on this thing. There is coming a restoration of my kingdom. All these things are light and momentary. I know it doesn't seem like it, but wait for me. Blessed are all those whose hope is in the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord. We are not going to be disappointed, right? So not only are our afflictions light, and not only are they momentary, not only are our sufferings and our trials and our temptations, uh, um, I just totally mixed it up, but not only are, are, is our afflictions light, not only are they momentary, but our sufferings and our trials and our temptations are actually doing something. They're not wasted. They're not being wasted. And I think oftentimes for the majority of us, we feel like they're all for naught. Again, like I say every week, in the, mac in the micro and in the macro. Like little things. We, we don't understand that all of these diverse afflictions, these many, are light and momentary. But not only are they light and momentary, because then you go like, okay, so, so then my mission set for life is to put my hands to the plow 
to lash it down with the leather lash and let it cut into the flesh of my skin and just grind it out to the end, right? Because that's what it would mean if it's just if it's just like mom. It's like you just suck it up, Buttercup, and you push through to the end, right? You go so because they're just light momentary afflictions. But that's not what it says. He adds a caveat to it, doesn't he? He says, no, not only are they light, not only are they momentary, but they're achieving something. They're doing something. It's not vain. They're not in name. God is not a hard taskmaster. He's not a, he's not, what do they call him, like the, the, the watchmaker that just set it and lets it go and doesn't have to worry about it. All right, we'll keep it going after our explosion of Cheerios. Are you eating those? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep going. So, what was I talking about? Let me put it back here. Not only are they light, not only are they momentary, but our, suffers, our, our sufferings and our trials are achieving something in us. It's a very particular distinction to make because that's what Peter is speaking to here in First Peter as we continue to dig into this verse about the fact that and all this we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that. There's a so that moment that I always say, whenever you see so that, circle it. Whenever you see therefore, circle it. Whenever you see so then, circle it. Because it's telling you, it's qualifying exactly what we're supposed to do. And what it's doing, every time you see that so that, is it's grinding in a good way. It's grinding and solidifying your identity in Christ alone. Whenever you see that so, so that transition. So that's why I always hone in on that every time. So... Great sorrow, the grind of this world, the grind of our relationships and hopes deferred is actually necessary for our good. Do we realize that? It's necessary for our good. The trials are necessary for our good. It is actually more precious than gold. The testing and the trying of your faith has more value than anything. Here, I'm going to pass this around. I brought this down. This is an ounce of gold. Most people... In America, have never seen physical gold. And I want you to look. So think about a rock in the side of a mountain coming out, and eventually it gets to this point. Think of the process that it takes to get to this point. Think of how obscure it is. Think of how precious it is to the Lord. Even all throughout Scripture, you can pass around and look at it. You think all throughout Scripture, God actually very specifically and particularly speaks to the value of gold. It has value to God. So anybody who says it's worthless, it's not worthless. In fact, God uses it to make his streets in heaven because he's, he created it as a precious metal. It's very obscure. It's very hard to find. The amount of labor that it takes to purify gold is insane if you think about the process. Now, what is the process of the purification of gold? Anybody throw some things out there. Heat. Pulverizing. The first thing is it is pulverized. You've been in mining. Yeah. You worked in the mining industry for years. It pulverized. It's dug. It's blasted. It's dug. It's hauled. Then it's crushed. And then it's crushed. And then it's pulverized. And then it's crushed. And then it's fired. And then scraped off. And then it's fired again. And then the dross is scraped off. And then it, and then the temperature is put up even more. And it's scraped off. And then there's and then there's chemicals that are added to it to pour out even more. So then it's acid is poured on it to pour even more impurities and then it's fired again and then more acid is poured. I mean I've watched go ahead and watch it because this will help help you with your your our Christian understanding of what it means when it says your faith is more precious than gold dull or refined or it says like your faith being purified seven times over in a refiner's fire or like Job when he says though though I have been refined like gold I will come forth you know like Job says this awesome word Go watch on YouTube the process for the purification of gold and go, oh, the Lord is achieving something in me by my afflictions. There is only one way to achieve that wherever that, and I better get that thing of gold back. <laughs> I've got my hand here. Um, he's achieving something in us, right? So God's, in Lamentation 3, guess what God says? He says, I don't willy, willingly bring afflictions on the sons of men. I actually love Lamentations 3. It's probably, besides Malachi 3, it's probably the, my most read verse in my life is uh, Lamentations 3. And because of what's contained within it. But it says in, in, the, in the Lamentations 3, it says, God does not willingly bring affliction on the sons of men. So that means if you are experiencing affliction, and I'm telling you, like, think, we got to think big picture. This is like the grind of relationships. 
This is failed relationships. This is money. This is identity. This is self-esteem issues. This is body issues. This is whatever it is. It's like these are afflictions. They come in all these different forms. And what it's actually doing, I, God says, I don't willingly bring afflictions on the Son of Man. So when I do bring them on you, it actually only has one specific purpose. That is to purify you, to sanctify you, and it's unto your sanctification. It says, God, can calamity come upon a nation unless the Lord has decreed it? No. Can calamity come upon you unless I've allowed it? No. Look at the story of Job. I'll allow that to occur to him. I will allow that. I will allow the powers of darkness to afflict him in a certain way, but there's boundaries. Why? Because it's going to achieve something. And look at what the, not only did it achieve something in Job, and not only did it achieve something in, in the restoration of Job and his family, has it ever achieved anything in you guys, reading the, Job's account? Has it achieved something for thousands of years to the glory of God and to the humbling of men? Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without wisdom? Oh God, you're God, I'm not. When God gives his rebuke to Job, do you know any of this stuff? No, neither can you know my ways. So humble yourself. I'm God, you're not. And Job says, Job says, Job. Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But you know what? He is the God of my life. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as pure as blood. Have we benefited from that? Yes. We absolutely have, right? So God only brings on us what is in proportion and necessary for our sanctification. For the achievement, for the mission set of an eternal glory. Did you hear that? God only brings afflictions on you that is necessary and proportioned to your sanctification. Some people get legitimately crushed and destroyed. And if it saves their soul, is it worth it? Absolutely. Some people are in Christ and they fight their flesh for their whole life, 35 years of the same stupid, stupid, inane, vain sin issues. And they grind it out, and they grind it out, and they grind it out. They don't realize how deep their sin is. You, only to when they're in their 50s or 60s or 70s, all of a sudden they get freedom from it. And they praise and worship God in a way that they've never been able to before. And God goes, I didn't waste any of that. Not one ounce of your 35 years of rebellion and fighting your flesh did I waste. Because it accomplished what you're bearing with us to today. It was totally worth it. I didn't put anything more on you than what was necessary and proportional for your good for your sanctification, right? Troubles only come upon us as we have need and they only stay as long as they are needed. It's important. They only come as we have need and they only stay as long as they are needed. And I've noticed that in my own life. It's like, I like obviously I have a strong personality, strong character, strong will. And so you don't realize how long you can fight against the Lord years and years. That's how strong our resolve is in our flesh. Well, we know what we ought to do. We know what His Word says. We know the benefits of submitting and surrendering ourselves to the Lord. We know the benefits of trusting His ways and doing it His way. We know it, but yet something in us just goes, but I'm still going to hold some for myself because I don't quite trust you. I'm, I have some disbelief and I think I can still grind this out and just add you to it. And we can do, the Lord will let us grind that out for years. That's how strong our will is. And he'll allow it to remain on you until it accomplishes its purposes. The effect, so here's, so, so here's the good insight of all this. What is the effect in the trying of our faith? Back to 1 Peter. There are scripture in 1 Peter. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, so the proven genuine, genuineness of your faith is more valuable than that gold I just passed around, which is considered the most precious thing on the face of the earth in all of creation. And God created it. So it says more precious than that because that will perish though, though refined in a fire may result in something. What is, the, what is the effect of the trying of our faith? Anybody? Salvation is one. Actually, we studied that last week. It says that you, you're receiving the end result of your hope, the saving of your soul, the salvation of your soul. But it says, praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Our trials and our testing are unto our probation, not to our destruction. The trials and testings are to our advantage, not to our ruin. They're to our commendation, not our condemnation. They're to our encouragement, not our discouragement. Our trials and testings are unto something. It says that it may result in something. 
and here's and here's what's crazy. Okay, this is crazy. This is what it's going to result in. You getting praise, glory, and honor at the coming of Jesus Christ. You. You getting praise and glory and honor from the King of glory. From the King that is all honorable. From the King that is all worthy of praise. He says, actually, your testing and trials is I'm going to come to you and I'm going to give these things to you. How unjust is that, right? Like, you want to talk about an injustice. He's going to come to you and say, listen, the endurance and the steadfastness of the trying of your faith is to result in something that's going to result in your praise, your honor, and your glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. That is insane to consider that the King of Glory is going to come and give you honor, right? So I said, listen, this is to our commendation, not our condemnation, right? It's a huge distinction. And I, so I, I, I have some, I, I'll get into it later and say I have some visual representations of that, but we'll get into it later because I think I dig deeper into it later on in my notes. So listen, here's one of the most profound aspects that I ever think of our calling election that I can ever wrap my pea brain around. And it's right here in, in 1 Peter um, 6. I've talked, or no, sorry, 1 Peter 7. I've talked about it a lot in my life. I've talked about it with people on side conversations because I can't get my mind around this all the time. When I think about the trials and the sufferings and the tribulations of this life, and I think about God's goodness and wisdom, like how, how wise is this God that we serve that he says that all these trials have come to prove to you that your faith is genuine. You pick up on that? He says, I am going, the proven genu genuineness of your faith, I can't say that word, the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise and honor and glory to receiving at, at the revealing of Jesus Christ. I am going to prove to you that your faith in me, that your trust in me, that your love for me is what you think it is. I will prove it to you because watch this. I'm going to pour it on, boy. And I'm going to pour it on hard. And I'm going to pour it on in a manifold way, in a multiple way, in diverse ways. The trials, the testings, and the temptations of this life. And as I pour it on, like Peter, think of who's writing this. Peter, remember? What, what did Peter do? We talked about it at the opening of, of going through this book. What happened to Peter? His great, the greatest failing that I could ever think of a, of a believer in Jesus Christ experiencing, what did he do? He denied Christ. He denied Christ. And what did Christ then restore in Peter and prove to Peter beyond anything Peter even knew and understood? What did he then reprove to Peter after Peter's great failing? How, yeah, how much Peter actually did love Jesus. He proved to Peter that he loved him more than he ever even knew he loved him. He proved to Peter Peter's faith was steadfast. He proved to Peter that Peter knew and understood the forgiveness of sin. He proved it to him. He said, I'm going to prove it to you, boy. I'm going to prove to you that your faith is genuine. So that's why we don't shrink back from the testing of this life. Remember, it's achieving something in us. It's even solidifying our very understanding that we really do love God. When the governments come against you and you don't shrink back from death, he is proving to you that your faith in him is sincere. You don't love your life so much as you're afraid to lose it, right? He's so loving and so wise beyond our ability to even perceive and perceive, conceive that he proves to us that our faith is genuine. To Abraham, who with faith raises a knife to his son, I said, I've chosen him because he believes in me. Look it. I will prove it to you, Abraham. You will even raise a knife to your son. And then I'm going, to, I, I'm going to prove it to you. To David, he proved to David, you really are a man after my own heart. I'll prove it to you. Even in great sin, even in sin and, and failing and even in murder and even in adultery, you will run to me who has the ability to cover your sins. I will prove to you that you truly are a man after my own heart. To Peter, I will prove to you that your love for me is actually deep. And when you said that you will do anything on my behalf, Peter, when with zeal you stepped out of the boat and onto the torrents of the waves, that you actually do love me and believe me that much. I'll prove it to you. Watch this. To the tribulation saints, he says, I'll prove to you that you know that your hope is in me alone and that you are longing for a kingdom not yet your own. I will prove to you that you know and understand that death has lost its sting. Why? Because you won't even shrink back from death and you won't love your life so much as you're afraid to lose it. I'll prove it to you. 
I will prove to you the genuine, genuineness of your faith. And again, what is the result of that? Praise, honor, and glory at the revealing of Jesus Christ. Your, your praise. It's insane. Why would God praise us? Why would Jesus praise? But that's who he is. It's like, it's insane. Talk about an upside down kingdom. Like how many of you go, yep, I think I'm, I'm worthy of praise and honor and glory from Jesus. Anybody feel that way? Not me. I know what I'm owed. That is a testament to the power of the gospel and to the reality and the majesty of this upside down kingdom that he's invited us into, right? So we, we like David who said, David said, oh God, I'm going to build you a house. And what did God say? You going to build me a house? No, I'm going to build you a house. We like David who said, God, I'm going to build you a house. We say, God, I'll show you through my whole life how faithful I am to you. God, I'll show you that I'm a man. God, I'll show you how much I love you. God, I'm going to strive and I'm going to work and I'm going to do and I'm going to produce and I'm going to obey. I'm going to, do, I'm going to prove to you, God, that I believe in you for the forgiveness of my sins. He goes, oh, you're going to prove your faith to me? No, 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 no. I'm going to prove your faith to you. Watch this. And he puts the pressure on because it is achieving in us something that far outweighs them all. The Lord through Paul asserts, prove your faith to me? Nah, I'm going to prove my faith to you. So when trying and testing and temptations, assault after assault, weariness upon weariness, doubt upon doubt come, God says, watch this, you won't cut and run. Watch, I'm going to prove it to you. You won't cut and run. Your faith in my son, your hope of the glory that's yet to come, and my love and my mercy towards me, it is genuine. I am going to prove it to you through light and momentary, yet very diverse, sorrowful difficulties, trials, struggles, and temptations. And all of it is an achievement in eternal glory that far away them all, right? So again, what's the outcome of this? Praise, glory, and honor. Hebrews 10, 32 through 39 affirms it in this. So this is Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, being publicly exposed to it, right? And sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Ha! <laughs> Think about that, right? Joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one, since you knew you have this, you joyfully accepted the plunder in your property. Not only were you afflicted and publicly ridiculed, but you stood next to other people who were, since you knew that you had this, a better possession. Therefore, he goes, reminds us of, therefore, don't throw away your confidence. This has great reward. Do not throw away your confidence in me. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Remember, what is the outcome of the trying of our faith? This reward, receiving what is promised. We have need of endurance to do the will of God because we know we have a better possession and abiding one. For yet in a little while, how long? A little while. The coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous ones shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But guess what? Here's the good news. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are those who have faith and preserve our souls, right? 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says this, that at the coming of the Son of Man, it says it's talking about things that are hidden, hidden sins, hidden intentions of the heart, but it says, but at the coming of the Son of Man, each one will be tested by fire and will receive his commendation. Is that, I thought about this again. So, so wait, so you're telling me that when the books are thrown open, for those who are in Christ, when the books are thrown open and we're sitting before the beam of seat of God and judgment's coming, for those who are in Christ, you're being judged. The judgment that's being passed on you is not to see where your failings were and where you blew it and where you fell short and where, you're, where you couldn't overcome your carnality, but the books are being thrown open and what's being burned off is all the dross. And it says, so at that time, he's going he's gonna to judge you and see what your commendations are. He's actually, for those who are in Christ, the judgment seat is to judge what your commendations are. It's to say, here's your rewards. That's why he says, that's why you have need of perseverance. Why? Because you have a better possession and abiding one. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence. This is your reward. 
Don't throw your confidence. This is your commendation. Remember, these are light and momentary troubles. It's achieving something in you. An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So don't fix your eyes on these things. Fix your eyes on those things, right? It says, these are many afflictions, but they're light. All kinds of trials that you're going to suffer, but it's going to prove the genuineness of your faith, and it's going to result in something. Glory, honor, and praise. It actually says, when the books are thrown open, you're going to be judged in justice to see what your commendations are from everlasting to everlasting. Is that crazy? Here's the commendations, right? A commendation, I have them right here. These are so in mind from A commendation is a military medal pinned upon your chest. Boom, you get a fat stack. Commendation. All these ribbons represent medals, right? So they're medals that you get for different things, right? You have these medals. If you haven't seen military medal, these are some of mine from the Marine Corps. You get these military medals. And the commander in chief, and he comes up to you, and he goes, Front and center, you know, whatever. Mario, front and center. Go, you better get locked on. Yeah, and you come up and you're like, yes, sir. And you're, and you're seeing there's pomp and there's procession, right? And everybody, and there's a cloud of witnesses that are bearing witness to what's going on. And he comes up and they read the sound citations. He said, if you've ever heard a military citation, they're pretty legit, right? You know, for gallantry and valor in the midst of an, an enemy insurgents and blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and keeping and reflecting the, and devotion to duty and the Marine Corps to which he belonged and all these th these beautiful, elegant words. And he says, this is to your commendation. The commander-in-chief marches up to you in front of all the witnesses that are gathered there and goes, boom, he pins it on himself. He himself pins it onto you. And there it stays on your uniform in the form of ribbons, right? So you don't have metal banging, you know, messing around. But it stays on there. For the, for the whole time that you are now representative of that military. I now, even as a civilian, can wear these ribbons on my suit jacket. And some guys do. From ever, from, never lasting, never lasting. In this land, in the land of living, it's a type and channel of the kingdom of God. I get to wear these commendations wherever I go for the rest of my life. I can display them. I can wear my uniform whenever I want because the commendations have been pinned on my chest. And so the Lord says, look, these light and momentary afflictions are achieving something in you. Glory, honor, and praise. When Jesus Christ is revealed, and when he comes and he tests everything with fire, he's going to judge you to see what your commendations are, what you rewarded. And you will have that stack, whatever your stack is, whether it's one or whether it's many, doesn't matter, on your chest from everlasting to everlasting in the presence of the King. So this is what Peter, again, is working into the church. He's working into them. Why? Because they are suffering. Because it does require perseverance. Because our, we do lo lose heart. We do become weary and disenchanted and disenfranchised. We cry out, woe is me. How long, O oh Lord, how long? That's why Peter is restoring them and saying, church, persecution is coming. Persecution is here. Solidify your eyes, of your, the eyes of your heart and of your soul and spirit in your inheritance and the joy set before you. And in these things rejoice. And these things, memory said, he diminishes them instantly. Light, momentary, not worth considering, not a big deal compared to this. You're like, but I'm like, the FBI is <laughs> showing up and what is going He's like, eh, don't worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Instead, realign your eyesight on these things. And that is how you will persevere. That is how you, you, you will endure. That's how you'll be steadfast. So we have to renew our, our weary hearts and renew our eyesight and steady our hearts on the Lord. Because the tried Christian is actually the true Christian. The tried Christian is actually the authenticated Christian. It is a hallmark and an authentication of our faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ. Right? It is an authenticating factor. There are five attributes that we're going to go through that reprove us as we're suffering. What are we reproved to? Because it says these trials are going to come to prove your faith. What's it going to prove in us? What's it going to solidify in us? How is it that the tried Christian is actually a hallmark and a testament to the true Christian? If you, um, you know, and, and this isn't condemnation, but we do need to test ourselves and challenge, are we really all in for Jesus? If you say, hey, I've lived my whole life to be all things to all people, perversion of the word, by the way, perversion of that scripture, to be all things to all people, I accept everybody and everything. I stand for nothing and do nothing, but I'm super friendly and super positive of everybody, and I don't drink alcohol, and I don't cuss, and I don't chew, and I don't date girls that do, right? 
then I'm actually crushing it for Jesus Christ. That is how, that is self-authenticating that we're in Christ. But what the word says is the total opposite. You, if you suffer with me, you will be unified with me. If you're not ashamed of me before men, I will not be ashamed of you before, before the Father. Because you have suffered in this sake, this, because this, because this, therefore that, so then that. It goes on and on and on saying, this is actually how some of the authenticating factors of being all in for Jesus Christ. There's a cost to it. If they, the, the student is not above the master, if they call me the else above, how much more are you going to call you? So it's actually, again, like we said, there's this inverse relationship. As we become, and we talked about in the first two weeks that we're breaking down Peter, as we increasingly grow in the Lord and allow him to have his way in our lives, we become increasingly estranged from the world around us. We do not look like them. We do not act like them, and therefore we're rejected by them. We do not accept the things that they accept, and therefore they do not accept us. We are mocked, we are stopped, we are, reviled, we are reviled, we are deemed domestic terrorists. Uh, we have a president who in a town hall meeting during the election, a CNN town hall meeting, said that um, Christians sh should be likened unto terrorism, and it was his plan to use the full force of the DOJ and the Department of Homeland Security to compile lists and to uh, uh, collect data on them because they're a threat to the sovereign. Why? Why? Because we stand for rightness and righteousness? Because we say the Lord can forgive your sins and he loves you and he's made a way for you. Though he's given you the bread of adversity and the drink of affliction, he's not going to be hidden from you forever. If you repent and confess your sins, he's faithful and just, he'll heal you and forgive you. And you have an inheritance that's being kept. In. Because we say those things, we're being deemed domestic terror. Because we were praying in Washington, D.C. We're being deemed an, an insurrectionist. What? How could that be? How could that be? But it is. So as we increasingly grow with the grow in the Lord and increasingly walk with the Lord, we are increasingly an enemy and that much more of an enemy of the powers of the darkness. So they're like, now I will destroy you. I will come at you with everything, right? So the tried Christian is a mature Christian. This is number one. The attributes that, re that are reproved in us as we suffer. The tried Christian is a matured Christian. James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers. Did he say count it all with happiness and gladness? No, nope, he did not say gladness or happiness. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet many trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith, what's happening to your faith? It's being tested. Here we go, this tested genuineness of your faith. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance have its full effect, that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What makes you mature and complete? Testing, testing of, of your faith, which produces perseverance. And the perseverance is what actually makes you mature and complete. Have you ever thought about that? That the number one thing that, I, that is an identifier or an authenticator of increased maturity in Christ Jesus is that you're persevering. You ever think about that, really? What does that mean? Like the depth of what he's saying right there. That the hallmark of an identity of Christ is our ability to persevere. To persevere in crummy marriages. To persevere under unjust suffering. To persevere in, a, in, a, in hostile territory. That's what the title of the series is, right? Living in hostile territory. To persevere in hostile territory. To persevere against even your own flesh that's one within you. Like, but I want this, but I want to honor the Lord, but I want this, but I want to honor the Lord, and I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do, and I'm such a wretch. He's like persevering. That actually begets maturity in the Lord. What have we told, what have we been trained to know and understand uh, begets maturity in the Lord? What have we said is the hallmark of a mature Christian? Some. I mean, just throw out anything out there. I mean, but what have we what have we been taught in our American evangelical paradigm? It looks like to be a mature Christian. Yeah, oh, awesome stability. So you're a good steward. That shows maturity in Christ. What else? Yeah, well, I was going to say self control. So that you you you're always friendly at all times no matter what's happening and that is the hallmark of a mature Christian it's not true it's not what it says 
says you count all pure joy when you meet diverse trials for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete lacking nothing right we are commanded to arm ourselves with a proper attitude towards suffering knowing that the more we suffer in the body the more we are done with sin the less we live for our own selfish earthly desires and the more we live for the will of god did you hear that it's like this it's like this cyclical thing it says this is in first peter 4 we'll get to it in who knows how long months probably right as we go through first peter but we are commanded it says arm yourselves with the same attitude as christ jesus knowing that the more we suffer in the body it's testifying that we're dying to sin and as we die to sin that we no longer live for our earthly desires but we're actually living for the will of god right so what it's saying is that is a call under perseverance. There's no shortcut to maturity in Christ. There's no shortcuts to a confidence in Christ alone. As you persevere, guess what gets built up in you? A confidence that Jesus is my all in all. It doesn't matter what's happening externally. Perseverance teaches and trains your hearts these things. Therefore, that's why you become mature and complete lacking nothing, you know? There is no shortcut to an identity in Christ alone. It is forged through fire and hammer and anvil. Another thing worth watching that's super cool is to watch how they make the, uh, what's the samurai sword? A sh shikama? Shikama? Am I saying that right? I, there's a whole process that's the number one most valuable sword on the face of the planet. And when you watch the process for what it takes to forge that sword and to get that edge on it to make it the best, it is months long process of firing and hammering and plunging and firing and hammering and plunging and firing and, and it's over and over and over and over again and what's the end result a sword a weapon that never loses its edge that is actually able to do exactly what it was designed for take the sword of the spirit which is the word of the lord arm yourself with the same man of christ put on the full armor of god so that you may be able to accomplish the Father's will, right? So these things are so important. There's no shortcut to the 90.9999% pure gold. It's through pulverizing, heating, and reheating, right? Listen to Paul. He says this. I always key in on this throughout his, throughout his letters. He says, this I have learned. And I'm always like, huh, that's interesting that it's learned. See, we, we, get, we even look at the highlights reels of these apostles or the heroes of faith faith we get these highlights reels of their lives and we're going like man these guys were studs in the faith man these guys were rock stars man these guys just crushed it they were never doubtful they just kept persevering and didn't matter what came at them they advanced the gospel and they were rejoicing the whole way and i go oh that's not true man read the scriptures it says i have learned i have learned i have learned why through persevering unto maturity through diverse trials i have learned these things paul says i've learned to be content that was a learned thing through trials, Philippians 4. He learned he can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4. He learned to never look back but only look forward towards the prize, again, the hope of glory, Philippians 3. He learned to stop relying on self but only on God. Listen, he says, these things, these trials have come so that, there's the so that, circle it, so that. 2 Corinthians 1, 9-11. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Have you ever been to a point where you're actually like, I'm done? Mm -hmm. Like, for real, like, I actually think I might die. Even because your spirit and your soul is so crushed within you that you actually physiologically feel like you might die. Have you ever been to that point of despair? I have once in my life just from 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 the woes of life not to mention physical i've been in the physical stuff a lot but but the woes of life and it says so we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself indeed we had received the sentence of death this is diverse trials achieving something in paul but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises us from the dead. It was for a reason. It happened for a reason. He has delivered me from such a deadly peril. He will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope, and he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. He has delivered, he is delivering, and he will deliver. That's what I've learned. 
That's what I've learned. So again, the tried Christian is a mature Christian. There's only one way to it. This too is why the epistle gives such clear instructions for the church and church discipline, however difficult it may be, because he knows that there is a greater purification process happening. He's like, hey, this is why we discipline the way we do. It's trial. Even if it's a trial to discipline, hey man, if somebody among you claims to be a value, sexual moral, impure, greedy, such a man's an idolater, hey, we need, to, we need to do business with him in a very significant way. We need to hand him over to Satan with the hopes that he'll be sifted by Satan and that he'll repent. We need that trial to come on to him. Why? Because that testing of his faith will actually produce something. Don't shrink back from allowing your brothers and sisters to be tested in this way. Don't shrink back from it. It's about the greater good. It's about the greater purification. It's about the greater sanctification. So he even speaks to it in that way, right? Number two, the tried Christian is the warrior Christian. Those of a warrior spirit. Judges 3, 1 through 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. To what? Test them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war. To teach war to those who had not known it before. Did you hear that? These are the nations. These are the nations. The five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon and Mount Baal Hermon and as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Did you hear that? God actually leaves enemies in the land to test you, to teach you war that you might know war. And to show you and reprove again your faith in him. To prove the genuineness of the faith in him. And to teach you warfare that you might know warfare. How many of us spend our whole lives trying to perfectly pad ourselves from having to experience discomforts and hardships and trials? How many of us raise our children that way? Everything we do is to make sure like we create buffer upon buffer upon buffer of hardship. Oh, 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 they're being bullied? Yank them from the school. Oh, they're being whatever? Yank them from this. Oh, they're having doubt? Yank them from this. Oh, they have self-esteem issues? Okay, give them all these things about self-esteem. Like, like we try to remove any hindrance to our children. What does God say? Ah, uh -uh, that ain't love. Let them experience war that they might know war. Every single generation had to learn to fight for themselves. I've told my children, I'm not fearful that you're having to deal with that. I've had... I've dealt with people that are like, hey, I'm really down on the Lord whether or not I'm saved. I'm like, praise God. Go work it out with Him. Why? Because he will, you will be reproved in it and you will have to wrestle out your doubts and test what you really think and believe it. I'm not scared about the warfare. Oh man, I have sleep paralysis at night and I have demonic things coming in my house and blah, blah, blah. Yeah? How are you going to learn to fight them? Right? That's okay. That's all right. God's not going to give you over to them. But he's going to teach you how to fight. He's going to teach you how to pray. He's going to teach you how to have an identity in him alone. He's going to, he's going to make you scour the scriptures, right? To solidify yourself and what you do have in Christ and your authority over these things. It's going to do something in you. I'm not scared of the warfare. And neither should we be. The tried Christian is those of a warrior spirit. The only way to be branded a warrior, to be branded a man or woman or of valor, is to get in the war. There's only one way to be called a warrior. You don't get, I, I hate the Christianese. The seeker-friendly, lukewarm church is grabbing these little uh, neuro-linguistic catchphrases of warrior right now. Have you heard that? And it ticks me off. Because I know what it costs to actually be a warrior. That's why I wrote the book, Equipping a Warrior Class. Right, like, the, you guys know, like, that's my whole ministry, is our warrior identity in Christ alone. And I see all these powder puff people grabbing this language and using this language because it's an emotionally pretty, you're a warrior. You're a warrior. And, they're, and I'm like, do you understand what that means? Do you understand the cost? Do you understand the nature and the savagery of warfare? Do you understand what it's like to have to feel the sentence of death in your very body? Do you understand what it's like to lay, to, to actually lay down your life for your friend? To lay down your sense of self? Do you know what it's like to not love your life so much? Like, you don't get to claim that title unless you've been in war. So the tribe Christian actually is those of a warrior spirit. We're told right here, right? We can't think it's strange when we have to work out our salvation from the trenches. We can't think it's strange. 
We can't think that God has abandoned us, that he has handed us over, that he is not near to us, that he does not love us or forsake us, that he does not see our our lot, our estate in life. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, is going to result in something. Don't think it's strange when you're having to wrestle out your walk with the Lord from trench, from the trenches of trench warfare. That we are constantly, continuously, and rigorously engaged in savage combat. Combat for our thoughts, or combat in our, for our bodies. Combat for the body, for the church, having to fight for one another. Combat in our relationships against the corrupt and perverse world systems. That you have to combat to actually keep your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't think it's strange. First Peter 4, again, we'll get to this in depth later on in this study. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you. There it is again. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. Do what? There it is again. Rejoice. And as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that, transition to the why, you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. What kind of joy? Overjoyed. I don't even know what that is. But it's got to be amazing. <laughs> To be overjoyed, you know, it's got to be an amazing thing. Second Timothy 2, share in sufferings as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. Remember, the tried Christian is of a warrior spirit. The tried Christian is a warrior Christian. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him, right? Warriors, as they endure and as they suffer and as they do these things, guess what they end up getting? through trials and testing together. You know what forges the relationship, what forges that brotherhood, that esprit de corps, is the suffering. And on the back side of it, they have a singleness of mind. They have a singleness of intent. They have a singleness of a mission set. They have a singleness of a spirit, esprit de corps. They're actually one mind, one body, and one spirit. In the natural, that's what happens in warrior cultures. Because they sweat together. They endure together. They grind together. They bleed together. They're willing to lay down their lives together. They suffer. That's what produces a warrior, is suffering. So the mature Christian is a warrior Christian. And that's what we're called to be in Christ Jesus, right? Number three, the tribe Christian is hopeful and a joy-filled one. The tribe Christian is a hopeful and joy-filled one. How many times have, have we already read Speaking of suffering where it says rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in as much. Rejoice in this. Give thanks in this. So the tried Christian is actually one who's joyful. Remember what perseverance produces? Maturity. Lacking nothing. Complete and lacking nothing. So the trials actually produce a worship-filled heart. How many of you believe that? It does if we persevere under the trial, right? Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also attained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of glory. Hope, light and momentary, light afflictions, and inheritance being kept in heaven for you, right? We rejoice in the hope of glory. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. When's the last time you said, Praise be to God, my life sucks? <laughs> I said a lot. I mean, for real, think about it. Like, you go, Man, praise be to God. I feel like I can't get out of bed today, right? But does it say, Be glad in your sufferings? Uh uh. Remember, joy is distinctly different than happiness or gladness. It says, rejoice in your sufferings, knowing that your sufferings produce endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's why you rejoice in your sufferings. It's doing something. Notice every single scripture that we're covering is saying, don't lose heart. The suffering and the trials and the temptations of this life, it's actually doing something in you. It's achieving something in you. So what's the end result of rejoicing in your sufferings? It produces perseverance. Perseverance, again, produces character. So now that's twice we're saying it's all about persevering. 
This is what's going to create in you a mature identity in Christ Jesus producing. And that, and that perseverance produces character. And once character is realized, what do you finally have? A depth of understanding. Hope. And hope is not disappointing. So how, how contrite is it when somebody comes to you and you're like, I'm really, really, like, I'm devastated. I'm really struggling. And people go, you just got to have hope. You go, yeah, no, that didn't. Thanks, but no thanks. That really didn't comfort me at all. Like, 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 oh, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And it's like, like, listen, I know that's true, but you're not helping me right now. Like, like you, you need to, you need to do something. You, I, I need to be reminded. Listen, hope is the end result of persevering. You know what we ought to be saying to one another? Listen, persevere under this trial. God's not going to waste it. Listen, I know you're miserable. You're miserable. What if this continues for another 10 years? Are you willing to stay the course? Because listen, God's doing something in you. Pray that the Lord would sanctify this trouble to you. Pray that the Lord would sanctify this suffering to you. Lord, sanctify this suffering to me. God, you say that it's achieving something in me that I can't see. You say that it's producing something. You say it's going to result in something. God, I'm miserable. I hate this. I want out from it. Lord, sanctify this to me. God, give me the strength to persevere. I have none of my own. Rather than going, hey, just hope in the Lord. Like, no, hope is the end result of persevering. And it is deeply rooted. And that's when the rejoicing comes in a way that can't even be expressed. That's when you're unshakable. That's when the wave, that's a house built on solid rock. When the waves and the tolling come, it will remain standing. That's the value of what we're saying here. Our response to suffering testifies to who we are. It testifies to what we believe. Our response to it. So when our response to suffering is rejoicing, because we know that there must, remember what we said at the beginning? The Lord only, how did I say it? It's like as long as you need and only what you need. Like he allows the trials to come unto you for exactly what you need for your good for only as long as you need for your good. So we go, praise be to God, there must be something you need to do. I thought about that with all this recent stuff, you know, that I've been enduring personally. I'm like, I'm like, this sucks, right? And talking to guys, guys out on the side, like, this is terrible. Like, I'm in consternation. Like, I actually have anxiety. This is weird. I'm not an anxious dude. Like, I like, when I get pushed, when I get pushed, usually I want to fight harder, right? That's my predisposition. I got pushed this way and I crumbled under the weight of it. And I'm going, I feel ashamed. What I tell you guys? Pray for me. I feel shame. I haven't felt shame like this ever in my life. I feel like when Peter denied Christ, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed at my carnal response. So you know what my response has been? Because I feel deep shame because I got anxiety about being arrested for the cause of Christ. That's good. That's shameful to me. So the Lord showed me one. You're not as strong as you think you are, Jamie. You ain't as strong as you think you are. And two, pray that I would think that value that to you and solidify your hope in me and your identity in me. So I go, I got to go, Lord, sanctify this trouble to me. Praise be to you. You've brought it on for a reason. You've brought the suffering on for a reason. You've brought the sleepless nights on for a reason. You've brought the consternation, the vexation, the anxieties on for a reason. I will rejoice, God, that there's something you're going to solidify in me. And you're going to take me to the next level. Praise be to you, God. I want to be mature and complete, lacking nothing, right? Number four, the tried Christian is, the, is an intimately comforted one. The tried and tested Christian is an intimately comforted one. 1 Peter 5. After you have suffered a little while, here it is again, over and over and over again. He said the same thing. How long? A little while. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. A tried Christian is an intimately comforted Christian. That's why it says to suffer with Christ is to be unified with Christ. Because there's such a deep, rich intimacy. It says, when you have suffered, what's he say? For a little while, who's going to come and comfort you? Your brothers and sisters in Christ? The Word? Say the Word's going to comfort you. Say the world's going to comfort you. Say your family's going to comfort you. Does it say relief from the pressures of this life is going to comfort you? What's it say? It says Christ Himself. He Himself is going to come and put, squeeze your shoulder. It's all right. It's all right. 
he himself will restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. He himself. That is an amazing, that's why the tried Christian, the tried Christian is one who is intimately comforted and intimately knows the Lord. What is more, the tried Christian is an intimately unified one with one another and with our Savior Jesus Christ. We already talked about the warrior, right? How do we be unified? What creates a shared bond? You know why we do when we go do these warrior summit things or do whatever? Why we do the paintballing thing? Do you guys know why? It's strategic. I don't do that for fun. I do that because I know and understand from my background what creates a bonding, a unification of a bonding experience. You know what it is? It's shared suffering unto a mission accomplishment. That is the only thing that solidifies people. That's why the body of Christ is to be one mind, one body over which Christ is ahead because they suffer together equally for the name of Jesus Christ. And so then they become increasingly unified because they have this shared experience, this shared suffering. They're unified in it. And so then guess what they do the more and more? They worship louder. They love harder. They weep harder. They're compassionate more. They hold out more mercy. They want to be together more. Why? Because they have this shared experience. So even the whole design of the training that we do is to forge that because we know, Paul and I in the Marine Corps, that that's how they forged us to have a rich esprit de corps, to be lovers of one another and to be willing to lay down our lives for one another. It was only after we had suffered together that we were so unified, nothing will ever break that bond in that brotherhood, right? Same thing with us. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. This is how a tried Christian is intimately comforted one and an intimately unified one. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be to, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions. When are you comforted? When you're happy, happy, joy, joy, and you stick your head in the sand and you don't want to deal with anything that's going on in life? Are you comforted when you try to avoid the warfare and the fray and protect yourself from it and pad yourself with insurance after insurance after insurance after insurance in case something happened in your life, you'd be perfectly protected? No, it doesn't say that. It says, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Oh, it's for a reason. It's for a reason, right? With the comfort we ourselves have received and are comforted by God, for we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in the comfort too. Abundantly. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comfort comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you share in our sufferings. You will also share in our comforts. The tried Christian is an intimately comforted one. Lastly, the tried Christian is a crowned Christian. This is where it all gets to. And this is what 1 Peter 6 and 7 is speaking to. Right? This is what he's speaking to when he says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may had, have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined in the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the tried Christian shall be a crowned one. James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Who does what? Perseveres. Huh. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The tried Christian who perseveres is the crowned Christian. Romans 8, 18-24. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering. How do we know we're heirs with Christ and co-heirs with Christ? There's a big if there, right? If what? So is it if we say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so? It's not what it says. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs with Christ, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, there it is. Not even worth comparing. Remember the scales? Boom! The glory. Boom! The joy. 
Boom, the inheritance. It has so much weight, it is not even worth comparing to these things. Listen, because he just told you that you are going to be crowned. If indeed you share with the sufferings of Christ, in order that you may also share in his glory. He is the king of glory. He is crowned the king of glory. And those who remain steadfast, who persevere under trial, will be crowned with the crown of life. We ourselves, who have the first for the spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. This is powerful. This is powerful that the tribe Christian is the crown Christian. Remember we talked about the commendations? 1 Peter 2 talks about blessed are you when, are, are blessed are you when, you when you endure under unjust suffering because you're conscious of Christ. It is to your commendation. What is a commendation? Enduring under suffering unjustly because you love Jesus. It's a, it's a, it's a military medal pinned upon your chest. Come here, Maria. Front and center. Right? The tribe Christian is a crowned one. To those who overcome, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life. To those who overcome, to those who are conquered, who to those who conquer, they will not be hurt by the second death. To those who overcome, to those who conquer, they will give some of the they will be given some of the hidden man in, in heaven, and they will be given a white stone with a new name written on it. To those who overcome, to those who conquer, they will be given authority over the nations and they will be given the morning star. I don't know what that is. But that's a commendation that the Lord bestows on those who overcome. Who, under, who overcome and who endure and persevere under triumph. To those who overcome, he will speak and profess their name before the heavenly angels. What I say about receiving that commendation, it's in the presence of a cloud of witnesses and they call your name out from among the ranks. Sergeant Walden, whatever it was, center, and you march out, boom, pop, snap. You're the only guy, they call you out by name from the masses, from the cloud of witnesses, and they pin that commendation on you. They call you out by name. To those who overcome, he will speak our name before the Father and before all the angels. To those who overcome, to those who conquer, you will be a pillar in the temple of God, and you will be given a new name. To those who overcome, you will be granted the right to sit with me on his throne. Did he say the privilege? Think about that. Think about that. The right. That's insane. It, it, it should be a privilege. He goes, no, I'll grant you the right. You, have, you will have the right to sit with me on the throne. That's how big a deal it is. To keep your eyes fixed on that hope. To keep your eyes fixed on the inheritance. To endure and persevere in this life. Light momentary afflictions because it's achieving something in us that is so insane that we literally go, I've counted the cost. It ain't that big a deal. I'll be good to go, right? So again, we say, and all this we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, I'm going to prove to you that your faith is what you think it is. I'll prove it to you. Watch. I'm going to bring on the, I'm going to crank up the fire. I'm going to bring it on. Of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result and praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So this should be the cry of our hearts, ladies and gents. Lord, sanctify all this trouble to me. God, sanctify this trouble to me. And you want to know what? I praise you, God, because I know that you are. You are sanctifying this trouble to me because you have affirmed it by your word. You have promised it by your word. It's going to result in something. It's not vain. It's not in name. It's not worth it. It's not for my destruction. It's not for my ruination. It's for my good because you love me. God, I don't know what you have to do, but sanctify this trouble to me. I praise you, Lord God Almighty. You are proving that my faith is genuine. Give me all that I need. I have no strength of my own. Lord, teach me to be content in all things. Lord, teach me. I want to learn what it is to, to know that I can do all things for, through Christ Jesus. Lord, teach me what it is to have no regard for the things of this world, but only eyes for you and your kingdom. God, teach me these things. Equip me to persevere that I may be mature and complete, lacking nothing in this life. And that I may be overfilled with joy, with a warrior spirit, mature in the faith, loving my brothers and sisters, holding out the word of truth to a crooked and perverse generation. God, sanctify this trouble to me. That ought to be the prayers of our hearts in this generation, ladies and gents. That's the end. Let's pray.